handed out a couple things. One was this reminder card about our net casting that uh, he worked very hard on and taught us on all the things that I can't remember. Uh, Tumblr, we were already on Facebook, Flickr, Twitter, Google Plus. Have I forgotten anything? I don't think I have. And then he gave you this follow-up to the sermon, these lures, which uh, he asked you to hand out to get people connected to our church, and, and he's putting all kinds of things on there in uh, relation to the sermon and uh, things like that. And I handed one out to my insurance agent this week and asked him to check out uh, things and, and uh, just give me a kind of a critique, which he did. Uh, but this was your opportunity to, uh, as Nick said, throw out the lures and maybe we'll do as Jesus said, catch some fish. Well, it occurred to me, due to my vast years of experience as a pastor, that anytime somebody preaches a sermon like that, oftentimes people begin to think of reasons or excuses why they can't do that. Somehow they're not qualified. Or, you know, somehow uh, they, they can't participate. And so what I'd like to do is use the Apostle Paul's life and his experience and the change in his life to show you that regardless of your past or your present or your personal problems or anything else, that if God could use Paul, then he can use you. All right, so let's go to Acts chapter 9. I want to read verses 1 through 6, then skip down to verse 10 and read through verse 16. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Down to verse 10. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, again, here's the point of this morning. If God could take Saul, or a man like Saul, save him by grace and transform him into the great apostle to the Gentiles, then why not me? Why not you? He was a very unlikely candidate for the service of the Lord. He was feared by the Christians. He was hated by the Christians. He did everything in his power to destroy the name of the Lord. Yet God reached down, grabbed him where he was, and used him to change the world. Just think, the fact that we're talking about him here in church in 2013 tells you the kind of impact he's had on the world. This is a guy who was purposely hunting down Christians to torture and kill them. Now the temptation is, oh yeah, they're all, that's Paul. He's super saint. That's not me. Well, Paul didn't start out as a super saint. As he 
surrendered to God, God used him. No different than what God could do with us if we would surrender to him. So what I want to do is look at some obstacles in Paul's life, how they were overcome, and maybe some of those things fit you, okay? First of all, Paul had a past. Okay? So, our past is no obstacle. It will surrender to God. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. According to his own testimony, Paul was guilty of doing everything in his power to put Christianity to death. He was a murderer. He was a rebel against Jesus. Now, understand, religiously, on the outside, he was very bored. He thought he was doing God's work by killing the Christians. But internally, obviously, he was one of the most wicked people to ever walk the face of the earth. He approved the murder of Stephen. He guarded the clothes of the people that were stoning him to death. He was a wicked, wicked man. But that is not an obstacle to the saving power of Jesus and the grace of the Lord Jesus. When Paul received Christ and surrendered to him, he was changed. You ever experienced that? Raise your hand if you've experienced that change. Amen. Okay. So our past is no obstacle to being used in God's work. It doesn't matter what you did B.C. before Christ. It's gone. It's erased. It's forgiven. It's forgotten. The Bible calls this the new birth. Okay? There are three records of your past in the world today. One is what you remember. And if you're like me, if you choose to think about it, you have some very shameful memories. I don't want to think about it. The second record is people that knew you before Christ. They remember what you were like. And I can find some people that remember what I was like before Christ. Okay? And again, I don't like to be reminded. And the third record is carried by Satan, and he will throw that up in your face every time you go to do something for God. He will tell you just who do you think you are? Don't you remember? <laughs> yeah, I do. But there's one person, once you're forgiven, who does not remember. And that is God. He's forgotten our past. It's no obstacle to him. So your past is not an obstacle. Throughout the Bible, God has used lots of people in spite of and sometimes after their greatest failures. Peter preached his greatest message after he had denied the Lord. Moses was a murderer. God used him. Samson sinned against God, yet he killed more Philistines at the end of his life, after he was blinded, and he did throughout his life. Abraham was a liar, yet God used him. Jacob was a deceiver. God transformed him and used him. And there are lots of others. So our past is not an obstacle to go. And neither is our present. When Paul was uh, on his way to Damascus, he was going there with the purpose to find Christians, torture them, and kill them. He was filled with hatred. He wanted to destroy anything and anybody connected with the way or followers of Jesus. In spite of this, the Lord was able to change him, obviously, and use him for God's glory. And the same is true for us. Whatever your present circumstance is, whatever baggage you are carrying, he can use that, take you right where you are right now, change you, change what needs to be changed in your life, and then use you. And again, the Bible has all kinds of examples of this. I'm too old. Well, you know what? Moses was 80. <laughs> what God called him. He had other problems, too. He wasn't very eloquent. He was very afraid. And like many people, he was opposed <laughs> to what God wanted to do with his life. 
I might mention when I felt God's call in my life, I was also opposed to it. I had plans for my life. This was not it. Okay? Moses was opposed and God decided to use him. In spite of all that, God did use him. The gathering demoniac. He was a guy everybody in town was afraid of, but the Lord was able to take him. After he had caused so much trouble, he used him as a witness. In 2 Kings 7, we have a story of four lepers. They became saviors of Jerusalem. God just took them where they were and used them in spite of the circumstances. So your past and your present, neither one, are an obstacle to God if you will surrender to him. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we find this. And this is something some of you could say off by heart. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, Surrender. You give in. And you let God do with you what He wants to do. So, your past nor your present are a problem or an obstacle if you'll surrender to God. And neither are your personal characteristics. Now, Paul was feared by the followers of Jesus. They thought his conversion was a trap. He's faking it. He's just saying that so that he can infiltrate the ranks, he, so he can find out where we meet. He's really just doing this so he can be a spy and turn us in, and then they can kill us. So a guy by the name of Barnabas had to go with him to Jerusalem and, and vouch for him. Say, look, this guy's the real deal. He really has changed. And he's really a new man. He had some other personal characteristics that could have been a hindrance. In 2 Corinthians, it says this about him. His letters are weighty and forceful. And then I kind of feel like they were writing about me. In person, he's unimpressive. <laughs> and his speaking amounts to nothing. You were saying that about Paul. And Paul says this, I may indeed be an untrained speaker. And he also had poor eyesight. He says in Galatians, see what large letters I use as I write to you. He had several personal hurdles he had to get over, but in spite of his physical problems, his personal characteristics, God said, if you surrender to me, I will use you. One of the things that the devil will use to keep you inert. Chemistry box, you know what inert means? Useless. Useless. <laughs> <clears throat> it's to get you to compare yourself to someone else. You know, and pastors aren't immune to this. Nobody's immune to this. You know, well, if I was like them, you know, if I, my church was like that, if I had this, if I could only do that. You'll start to do that. The devil will say to you, well, you know, you can't really get involved and participate. You can't be used of God because you really aren't as good as that person. If you allow that to happen, you're going to be defeated before you start. We've all got little quirks, little personal characteristics that if we use them as excuses, they will keep us inert in the work of God. But God can take whatever we consider to be a weakness and use us anyway. In fact, he's pretty good. In fact, he excels at using weak people and foolish people. Again, I've already mentioned Moses. It's a guy with a speech impediment. But God used him. A young Jewish girl by the name of Esther saved her people from slaughter. An unknown boy by the name of David became the greatest king to ever sit on the throne of Israel. A beggar by the name of Lazarus preached a daily sermon to a rich man. How about the 12 unknown guys that Jesus decided to hang around with for three years 
one who actually ended up betraying him, he used them to change the world. In fact, you know what? I don't believe it's blasphemy for me to say this. Even Jesus had a few things that could have been problems. First of all, it was assumed by many that he was the illegitimate child of a Roman soldier. Now, I don't believe that. But some people back then did. Other people just said, hey, his dad's carpenter. He's Joseph and Mary's son. I mean, why was not he him? Dad's a carpenter. And he's from Nazareth. Did anything good come out of Nazareth? It's what you people have to deal with when you invite them to church. And they say, tell me about your pastor. And they say, well, he grew up near Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh? Did anything good come out of Pittsburgh? Penguins get swept in four? Are you kidding? Who wants to listen to anybody from Pittsburgh? You're welcome, bud. <laughs> I knew somebody was waiting for me to just acknowledge it, so. <laughs> my friend Andrew Demon put a picture of a broom on his Facebook page and said, to all my Pittsburgh Penguin fan friends. <laughs> anyway, they thought there's nobody, there's no way God can use somebody out of Nazareth. And other people questioned the fact that he was from Galilee. Some even said he was a tool of Satan. That with all those things against him, Jesus was used by his Father by surrendering to his will. Remember the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, here's what I figured out so far, and I hope you're with me. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what problems you have, or what personality quirks you have. Doesn't matter what your level of education is, and doesn't matter if you're popular or not, or accepted by other people. God will use you if you will make yourself available to Him and surrender to what He wants you to do. He's just looking for people that will do that. So the last thing, your private concerns are no obstacle. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, that he had a thorn in the flesh. And there's a lot of debate about what that is, and that's not what this sermon is about. We could talk about that sometime. But here's the important thing. He says, I prayed three times that God would remove it. And I'm sure when he prayed that, he was thinking to himself, you know, God, I could do so much more for you if you just remove this pain, this problem, whatever it was. And he said, I prayed three times, and God told me three times, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to use you in spite of that concern. So in spite of all his physical infirmities that plagued his life, Paul actually in 2 Corinthians 12, 10 stated that it was his weaknesses that gave him greater strength because it made him depend upon God more. So you might look at yourself and say, you know, I'm weak. I'm really not able to do a lot for God. I don't really think I can stand on my own two feet. And God says, just the person I'm looking for. I don't need people who say, here I am, God. I don't really need you, but I'm willing to help you out. <laughs> No. You know who God's looking for? I can't do this without you. You've got to help me. I know what you want me to do, but there's no way I can do it unless you help me. That's the person he's looking for. Someone who will cling to him. Again, we find examples in the Bible. Hannah wanted a child. She turned to the Lord in desperation and he gave her a son who became a great leader to the Israelite people. Daniel was just a teenager when he stood against the king of Babylon, but he was totally yielded to God. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, again, just a teenager. Un unmarried. 
God said, you're going to get pregnant for my son. She said, be it unto me as you say. In other words, I surrender whatever you want. I don't know what comes into your mind when you think of reasons why. Who, me? <laughs> Not me. Here are some things it could be, maybe. Maybe you're fighting depression, or loneliness, or feelings of inferiority, or maybe your past keeps flaring up. The devil throws that in front of you all the time. Maybe you just feel inadequate. I just want you to know this. To God, that is nothing. It's nothing. He can and he will overcome it. He'll take your life. He'll make it an inspiration to everybody who comes in contact with you. But the secret is in one word, and that is surrender. Are you willing to, every day, start again and surrender it to God? God can use your life. But I'm going to ask you four questions as I finish up here. Because these are all required if you want to be used of God. First of all, are you really saved? I'm not asking you if you're baptized or a good person or even a member of the church, but are you truly saved? Are you fully surrendered? Are you to the point where you say, God, there's nothing I won't, I, there's nothing I will hold back from you. Are you available for Him to use? Or have you got so much clutter in your life that, you know, God, I just don't really have time to go to church on Sunday, that's all I really have. Are you willing to remove some of the clutter to be available? And then are you willing? God is a perfect gentleman. He will never force us into anything. So, if the answer to any of those four things, are you saved, are you surrendered, are you available, and are you willing, then the Lord won't use you. But if it's yes to all four, then there's nothing that is impossible. Now, usually what happens at the uh, end of the sermon is I pray, I come up front, you all stand, and we say, we're going to do something a little different today. Not a lot, just a little. The guys are actually going to come up and do a song called Surrender. I want you to stay seated. And if you're willing to say yes to those four questions, yes, I am or I want to be saved. Yes, I will surrender everything. Yes, I am willing. What was the fourth one? Available. Am I available? Do you think you have a hard time listening to me? I have a hard time listening to me sometimes. Thank the Lord for notes. <laughs> I'm available. If you're willing to say yes to all four of those, stand up during the talk. Now, please do not do this. Do not say, I'm going to look stupid if I don't stand up. You know what? God knows your heart. I strongly encourage this. Be honest with him. I certainly am not going to pass judgment or think any less of you if you're honest and you say, you know what, I'm not ready to stand up yet. That's, that's not the business I'm in, passing judgment and criticizing. That, that. I am here to help. If you honestly think you can't stand up, Say yes to all of that. And I can help you get to that yes. That's what I want to do. Okay? All right. Let's pray. The 11 o'clock service at the end, we're going to sing a hymn called, I Surrender All. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I Surrender All. Lord, as we consider the words of this song, uh, there's going to be sung here in a few minutes. Help each and every one of us to just be honest with you. I pray this in Christ's name. As I said.